Welcome to COVID-19, What Pharmacists Know Now. My name is Denise Wary. I am a clinical pharmacy specialist in infectious diseases at Surrey Memorial Hospital in Surrey, British Columbia. And today I will be presenting on the COVID-19 mRNA vaccines, a recipe for success. This series is brought to you by the Canadian Society of Hospital Pharmacists, BC branch. I have no conflicts of interest to declare. The COVID-19 pandemic, however, continues to evolve and vaccine research is ongoing. The information presented is current as of December 18th, 2020. And I will state that the views in this presentation are my own and do not reflect those of the BC branch of CSHP. By the end of this presentation, you will be able to describe the mechanism of the BNT162B2 vaccine or the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. You will be able to evaluate the recently published interim results of the phase 2-3 study of this vaccine. You will be able to recommend COVID-19 vaccination based on current evidence, understand the recommendations surrounding use in special populations, and discuss the preliminary unpublished results of a phase three study of the mRNA-1273 vaccine, also known as the Moderna vaccine. Messenger RNA vaccines work by providing instructions or a recipe to our cells to make the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. The mRNA is delivered via lipid nanoparticles for stabilization and to allow entry into the cell. After the protein is made, the spike protein, mRNA is destroyed before it reaches the cell nucleus where our DNA is found. The spike protein is displayed on the cell surface and then recognized as foreign by our immune system. This triggers both a cellular and an antibody immune response. mRNA vaccines do not contain live, weakened, or inactive virus. You cannot acquire COVID-19 infection from vaccination. The two vaccines that I'll talk about today are the BN2162B2 vaccine, also known as the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, which has been approved for use in the UK, the US, and in Canada uh, for those 16 years of age and older. We'll also briefly discuss the Moderna vaccine, the mRNA-1273 vaccine, which has been granted emergency approval in the US as of December 18th, 2020. The BNT162B2 vaccine is currently being studied in an ongoing phase 2-3 multinational randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial. The interim results of this study were published in the New England Journal of Medicine in December. And these are the results that I'll present to you today. Participants were 16 years of age and older and were considered healthy or had stable chronic conditions. Important exclusions were those who were immunocompromised by condition or therapy, prior clinical or PCR confirmed COVID-19, pregnancy and lactation, contraindications to intramuscular injection, history of an adverse reaction to any vaccine or to a component of the vaccine being studied, and receipt of blood plasma or immunoglobulins prior to vaccine injection. The intervention were, interventions were the BNT162B2 vaccine at a 30 microgram or 0.3 mil intramuscular dose, uh, given as a two dose series, 21 days apart. About 21,000 patients were included versus a saline matching placebo, again, a two dose series, 21 days apart, and again, over just over 21,000 patients. Follow-up, this is an interim analysis, and so follow-up time varied after the second dose of the vaccine or placebo uh, up to a maximum of 14 weeks of follow-up as of October 9th. Lab confirmed symptomatic COVID-19 with onset at least seven days after the second dose was the primary efficacy outcome in patients who did not have a prior evidence of COVID-19. Lab confirmed symptomatic COVID-19 in participants with and without prior history of COVID-19 was another primary efficacy outcome. 
Safety outcomes included solicited adverse events, uh, use of pain or antipyretic meds within seven days of either dose of vaccine, and solicited uh, events were prompted by electronic diary. They also looked at unsolicited adverse events through one in six months after the second dose of vaccine or placebo. Participants in the study had a median age of 52 years and ranged from 16 to 91 years of age. 57% of patients were 55 years of age or younger. And the majority of participants were in the US and were white. And about 20% of patients had any Charleston comorbidity and the most common comorbidities were chronic lung disease, diabetes without chronic complication, any malignancy, and then obese patients uh, represented about a third of the population. This table shows vaccine efficacy against symptomatic COVID-19 after at least seven days after the second dose. You can see the number of cases in the vaccine group were eight, and the number of cases in the placebo group were 162 in participants without prior evidence of COVID-19 infection. Surveillance time is represented in 1,000 person years. Vaccine efficacy was calculated using a Bayesian model to generate a 95% credible interval, and vaccine efficacy was 95%. And those patients who had prior evidence and no prior evidence of COVID-19 infection, there were nine cases in the vaccine group and 169 cases in the placebo group, which again worked out to roughly a 95% uh, rate of vaccine efficacy. Of note, they also used a Bayesian model uh, to predict the probability of vaccine efficacy greater than 30% which translated to greater than 99% probability. For reference, the World Health Organization recommends that successful vaccines demonstrate at least a 50% risk reduction in disease and at least a 95% probability that the true efficacy exceeds uh, 30%. And so this vaccine candidate met both those requirements. This graph shows vaccine efficacy after one dose with the cumulative incidence of COVID-19 infection along the y-axis and the days after dose one along the x-axis. The placebo group is represented by the blue squares and the vaccine group by the red circles. Shaded squares and circles are severe instances of COVID-19. And as you can see, there is some efficacy after one dose of vaccine and also less severe cases uh, in the vaccine group. The inset graph also shows that the effect of the vaccine started to emerge after about 12 days after dose one. This table also shows vaccine efficacy after one dose. And if we look at after dose one to before dose two, 39 cases of COVID-19 uh, were confirmed in the vaccine group and 82 in the placebo group was translated to about a 52% uh, vaccine efficacy rate. Reactogenicity was studied in a subset of roughly 8,100 patients. Local events occurred more commonly after the first dose. Systemic events occurred more commonly after the second dose. Most events were considered to be mild to moderate and resolved within one to two days. These are normal expected events uh, that occur after vaccination as vaccine stimulates the immune response. Incidents of reactogenic events are outlined in this table according to age group, and these are the percentage of events uh, after the second dose of vaccine. Pain at the injection site was the most common local event reported. Fatigue and headache were the most common systemic events. And how this compares to other vaccines this is probably slightly more reactogenic than our influenza vaccines, uh, but similar to what you would experience with the shingles vaccine. Median follow-up for adverse events was two months after the second dose, with roughly 18,800 patients having had at least two months of follow-up. 
any adverse event reported in anyone who had received at least one dose of the study intervention did occur more commonly in vaccine recipients than placebo. Severe or life-threatening events were rare. Lymphadenopathy did occur more commonly in vaccine recipients uh, than placebo. Two deaths were reported in the vaccine group, four in the placebo group, and none of these deaths were attributed to either of the interventions and none were related to COVID-19. Allergy was not reported in clinical trials. Uh, the trial did exclude patients with a history of severe vaccine adverse events or anaphylaxis to any of the vaccine components. Since vaccine rollout, two cases of anaphylactoid reactions have been reported in the UK. Both of these uh, individuals had a history of severe allergic reactions and carried adrenaline auto-injectors on their person. Five cases are currently under investigation in the US. This vaccine is contraindicated if there's a history of anaphylaxis to any of the vaccine components, and if there's a suspected hypersensitivity or non-anaphylactic reaction, NACI, the National Advisory Committee on Immunization, recommends uh, investigation be undertaken and consider administering the vaccine in either a controlled setting uh, with extended observation and also to consider an allergist consultation. Non-medicinal ingredients are listed here for your reference. Uh, and the one ingredient that is highlighted, polyethylene glycol or PEG, is the ingredient that is suspected to be causing the hypersensitivity reactions. BNT162B2 is a frozen preservative-free suspension available in a multi-dose vial. It is stored at ultra-low freezer temperatures and must be protected from light. It can also be stored in its thermal shipper for up to 30 days by replacing its dry ice every five days. It can be thawed in the refrigerator or at room temperature. Thawed suspension may contain white or off-white amorphous particles prior to dilution. Refrigerated vials are stable for five days, undiluted and require about three hours to thaw. And room temperature vials are stable for two hours, undiluted and take about 30 minutes to thaw. The vaccine is to be gently inverted 10 times to mix prior to dilution. It's important not to shake due to the fragility of the mRNA. It can be diluted with the supplied 1.8 mils of sterile 0.9% sodium chloride. And it's important not to use any other diluent because the stability is unknown. After dilution, again, gently invert the vial 10 times. And after dilution, the multi-dose vial will contain five doses of vaccine. Diluted vaccine can be stored for up to six hours between 2 and 25 degrees Celsius, and it can be stored in syringe. No data is available on interchangeability of vaccine, and so if a series is started with the BNT162B2 vaccine, it must be completed with the same vaccine. Dosing is 0.3 mils intramuscularly in the deltoid, 21 days apart. A minimum of 19 days or a maximum of 28 days is acceptable based on data from other vaccines and the clinical trial. The majority of participants in the clinical trial received vaccine 21 to 27 days apart. It is important not to give with other vaccines because co-administration has not been studied. Also, co-administration with convalescent plasma or monoclonal antibodies has not been studied. Monoclonal antibodies do have a high affinity for the spike proteins expressed by the vaccine, so it's possible that either the antibodies or the vaccine could be rendered less effective. It's also suggested to wait for acute febrile illnesses to resolve before vaccination. This is similar to recommendations for other vaccines as well because it would be unclear if the febrile illness or the vaccine is causing a fever if one is experienced. In terms of previous COVID-19 infection, the National Advisory Committee on Immunization, or NACI, recommends offering a vaccine series to anyone who has had a prior PCR-confirmed SARS-CoV-2 infection if there's no contraindication. There's unknown duration of antibody response from natural infection. Testing for infection is not required prior to vaccination. It is reasonable to continue to prioritize previously uninfected individuals first, given that there is a limited vaccine supply at this time. 
It's also reasonable to delay COVID-19 vaccine for three months after PCR confirmed infection because observations have indicated that reinfections are rare within the first three months after natural infection. And again, wait for acute illness to resolve before vaccinating because it would be difficult to distinguish the symptoms of disease uh, from a vaccine adverse event. Pregnant and breastfeeding women were excluded from clinical trials, and so until further data are available, NACI recommends against vaccine in this population. It may be considered if the benefit is deemed to outweigh the risk to the individual and fetus or the individual and breastfeeding infant, as long as informed consent is obtained after a discussion regarding the lack of evidence in this population. 23 trial participants did report pregnancies uh, after vaccination, and these patients will be followed for pregnancy outcomes. And it's unknown at this time if this vaccine is excreted into human milk. Immunocompromised individuals were excluded from clinical trials, and NACI recommends against vaccination in this population until further data are available. It may be considered, however, if benefit is deemed to outweigh risk and informed consent is obtained. Immunocompetent HIV-infected individuals may be vaccinated, and they were included in the BNT162B2 study, and their outcomes will be reported separately. This vaccine is not authorized for use in Canada for adolescents 12 to 15 years of age. However, it could be considered for those at very high risk of severe outcomes of COVID-19 and who are at increased risk of exposure, for example, those who live in congregate care settings, as long as informed consent is obtained. For patients who have a history of a bleeding disorder, as long as an effort is made to minimize the risk prior to vaccination, vaccination can proceed. And for those who are on long-term anticoagulation, as long as they're not at higher risk of bleeding complications, it is safe to vaccinate these patients as well. Current eligibility for the BNT162B2 vaccine in BC are residents and staff of long-term care facilities, residents and staff of assisted living facilities, essential visitors to residents of long-term care facilities, and healthcare workers providing care to COVID-19 patients in settings like ICUs, medical wards, and emergency departments. The mRNA1273 vaccine, also known as the Moderna vaccine, was found to have a 94.5% efficacy in preventing symptomatic COVID-19 disease and a phase three study of roughly 30,000 participants. The study has yet to be published. And common adverse events were as expected, mostly local and systemic reactogenic events, which were more common after the second dose. It is dosed as a two dose series, 28 days apart. There are some administration and storage advantages in that dilution is not required. It can be stored in a freezer of minus 20 degrees Celsius, so it does not require the ultra low freezer temperatures. And it's stable in the refrigerator for 30 days and at room temperature for up to 12 hours post thaw. In summary, the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine has been approved for use in Canada. The two-dose series is approximately 95% effective in preventing symptomatic COVID-19 in persons 16 years of age and older. It has a similar safety profile in clinical trials to other viral vaccines after a median follow-up of two months. Clinical trials and safety monitoring are ongoing. I think vaccines are one ingredient to the recipe for success against COVID-19. However, it is important to continue to practice public health measures to prevent COVID-19 transmission. Some of the reasons for this are that there is a limited vaccine supply and we are undergoing a phased rollout plan. The vaccine is not 100% effective. It has been studied in a relatively healthy population. And so this population is expected to have a good immune response to vaccine. The duration of antibody response to the vaccine is currently unknown, and its effect on asymptomatic infections and community transmissions is also unknown. Ongoing studies are hoping to answer this question. Effects on hospitalization and deaths from COVID-19 are also unknown. That concludes my presentation. Thank you for listening and stay safe.